All right, so let's conclude market value. So what, if, if we were to be on the line to help owners uh, dramatically increase the value of their firms, it would be in market value because this is the value world of which they realize those, those dreams. Uh, five years ago, I got this crazy notion I could um, create extreme value in any firm and started this thing, which is now the world's largest uh, middle market mentoring firm called Midas Nation. And I spend most of my time in that where we take mundane firms who are worth nothing in 20x, 10x, 20x the market value of those firms within two to three years. So we've taken some firms from a beginning value of a couple million to 200 million in two or three years. And so, so, that, that's, so that's what we're talking about in terms of market value. What's risk? Well, that's the acquisition multiple specific to the buyer. You might call it the hurdle rate, which I'd be all right with. A return is the return available post-transaction. It isn't always going to be EBITDA. I'm just saying EBITDA on this slide just because the follow through from the prior slides. Um, I, I think given that there's a lack of uh, value engineering in the marketplace, uh, lack of that knowledge, this is, this is what America needs um, in terms of this is what the business owners need. There's a tremendous resistance of the business owners to allow for this kind of aggressive value engineering in their firms because it's, it's a totally different reality. You know, right now, what they're comfortable in is working on the $30 an hour job and below. We won't let them work on anything less than a $500 an hour job. Well, you, you can see the difference. I mean, what's a $500 an hour job? Picking the right niche, setting up with the right players, making sure you got the dashboards right, all that. $30 an hour job is, you know, making copies and getting on a forklift and going and moving a pallet of lumber. I mean, you, know, you don't create any value at less than a $100 an hour job. You create substantial value over $5,000 an hour. So in my investment banking firm, I'm not allowed to work on anything less than $10,000 an hour. I am disallowed. And so I get that every year. So how many hours do I want to work? Well, that would all be at $10,000 an hour above. So you all choose, we all choose this, believe it, we don't think we do, but we all choose how much wealth we create over time based on what we engage ourselves in and how we set the game up against that. And so we just don't know this. Typically what we work on is whatever comes through the door or over the transom. Um, all of this takes planning and positioning. And so we, we make that choice on how wealthy we're going to be. Um, that, that's one of those little secrets that uh, most people don't know. So, okay, enough of that. Fair market value, I'm not going to spend one minute on this other than to say what John Pagley and I and I and Pepperdine are doing. We've created this new model called the Private Cost Capital Model. It's a discount rate model using empirical uh, evidence from the, the Pepperdine Private Capital Market Studies to feed the model of which we'll finally have apples to apples, private discount rate, private uh, uh, discount rate return expectations to private valuation. My end game is to get this used across all value worlds. Uh, that'll take the rest of my life and most of yours. But eventually what will happen is I'll get at least six or eight of the authorities to adopt Peacock. Um, and, and there's every reason to think that will happen because I'm busy. I'm like a busy beaver uh, talking to these authorities and proving the case. John and I next year will write the private cost capital book. Uh, we've written a number of articles so far. We've talked about this 100 times between us in large group settings. Now we've got to write a book. Uh, and, but that's okay. We'll do that next year, and that'll pick up more steam. Uh, other than that, don't want to talk about fair market value because it's a notional world we don't care about. Uh, what I do want to talk about is private capital because now we're going to go into the second leg of the triangle. Um, why do we have a flea market, not a supermarket? If the U.S wanted to have a supermarket of private securities, could we? Yeah. Yeah, we could have audited financial statements for every private company and, and a standardized reporting. We could have the SEC drop down on the private side. Of course, that would be a real mess, but, but we could do that. Why don't we have that? Why don't we have those, those demands or even any really talk about structuring the private side along the lines of the public? Why don't we do that? Because capital providers make more money taking advantage of the the users of that capital on the private side. It's called an asymmetric information advantage. Think about who wins in the flea market. It's the people who live there every day. They know the rules of that market. Most business owners only access capital, what, every other year? They don't know the rules. Amazingly to me, most intermediaries do not make markets for capital. We run the exact same auction process for capital or equity interests. Same exact process. Like this $100 million we just raised for this Jersey company, we went out and identified who should be in the senior pool, ran an auction against the senior lending, 
ran an auction against a mezzanine, ran an auction against second lien lenders, had 10 term sheets in each of those pools come in the same week. We negotiated, 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 got it down to L plus two, L plus seven, done deal. Same auction process as if we were selling a business. Um, same fee structure, same amount for the memorandum. The difference is, what's the big difference between likelihood of success in a capital auction versus likelihood of success in an equity auction? Equity auction, what, what, is the, what is the batting percentage of, if you take on 100 deals, what percent do you close in an equity auction? You go to the Hall of Fame at a third. What's the batting average on a debt auction or capital auction? 750. We bet seven, same fee structure. 750 here, 350 there. I'll say no more. Um, in this bizarre, bizarre, there are structures and rules. Uh, it is financial hand to hand combat because everything's so one offish. Why won't Bank of America do a client deal this month when they did the exact same deal two weeks ago? Why won't they do that? Why all of a sudden do they, they say, well, no, to a deal? They did, wait a minute. Same industry, same size, same area. You just did this deal two weeks ago. They may have too many of the same deal on the <laughs> That's market. exactly right. They, they, they have to put money out occasionally. They met their goal, their portfolio goal two weeks ago. They don't want to take another machine shop or whatever the case may be. And so by going out to a dozen senior lenders in an auction environment, an organized cattle herd, of which the cattle are the, the debt lenders, by going out to them, we'll find out who's got to put money out this month. <laughs> That's what you find out. And their body language, they, they try not to show it. They're, it's so clear to me from day one who's going to be putting the money out. Because they're nervous. They gotta, hey, we forget these people have been hired by Bank of America to put money out occasionally or by Wells Fargo, Old Bar. And so by getting them all together in an auction at the same time, we allow that behavior to show. And it ultimately shows by a good deal, pretty good deal for our client. That's how it shows. They move their tents around, these capital providers, for portfolio reasons. They want to either lessen or, or increase the risk and, their port, risk and return on their portfolio. So they move around. You can't count on them doing the same thing. They will not do the same thing month in and month out. That's beautiful. For an intermediary, that's perfect. That means that the buyer or the, uh, the user of the capital needs to hire someone like us to canvas the market in an efficient, effective, short-term environment. Perfect. Couldn't ask for anything more as an intermediary than uncertainty of the market of attracting the capital. That's perfect. And so, all right, so here's the structure of design. It all begins with motives. Remember, motives of the owner selects value world, because reason leads to value world. Motives of the owner selects capital type, what their capital structure looks like. So what do they want to do? They want very few shareholders. They prefer to shoot the ones they have, truth be known. They're, they'd like to stretch the equity, obviously, because they're always trying to use non-dilutive, you know, that. Um, their number one motive is to um, eliminate personal guarantees. We started surveying this three years ago at, at the Pepperdine surveys. Most owners will pay an extra three and a half to four percentage points on a loan not to have a personal guarantee. I'm that way. I've borrowed hundreds of millions of dollars personally over time to buy companies. I always paid an extra three or four points not to have a personal guarantee. How did I do that? Who was I borrowing from? Banks? Nope. Who did, who did I borrow all that money from? Asset-based lenders. More on that in a second. Because they're regulated by a different part of the US government. I could cut a deal by paying more, not to have a personal guarantee, do it all day long. So the owners do not manage their business typically. The, 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 the pecking order of this is the siren song of the income statement. They pay somewhat, some attention to the income statement. Um, the balance sheet is viewed monthly but not managed. And the cash flow is something the CPA puts out. They have no idea what it is. So they sort of had the whole thing backwards in some ways. Um, in the big business, when I was running a big business, I was my bonus pool was based on return on net assets and how well I did against budget and, and other benchmarks. I was managing the balance sheet. Most of the owners, they just had never been educated on how to manage the balance sheet. So when we start talking to owners about return on equity, you see, that's a balance sheet. Well, that's part income statement, part balance sheet. That, 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 see, that, that balance sheet thing, I'm not, not sure about that. So they just don't live there, unfortunately. Now, another key term that I, uh, I didn't make up, but I, I cataloged in the uh, PCMs one that had never been in the literature before, is credit box. All capital providers have a credit box. And they use those, 99% of them use that term, credit box. 
all the credit boxes, and it's the characteristics you have to display as the borrower or the investee to get their money. So this is the key to the door, key to the vault. Key to the vault is a better way to say it. So if you display, and I'm going to show you a couple credit, at least one credit box here in the next slide. If you display the following characteristics, there's every reason to believe you have access to our vault. So then we talk. And so we survey, every six months at Pepperdine, we survey all the credit boxes in the private capital markets. Because that is what feeds the private cost capital model. We have to know what access is. How do you access from hedge funds to venture and angel to mezzanine to ABL to senior lenders, uh, commercial lenders? How do you access? Well, that's credit boxes. Those are credit boxes. Credit boxes. Feature capital providers has a unique return expectation. So their credit box leads to a certain return expectation. I'm not talking about interest rates. That's only part of it. I'm talking about the all-in return expectation. A few years ago, I wrote an article back when, well, this is more than a few years ago, back when Prime was like 5%, Prime interest rate, how Prime plus 3 equals 40%. Let's do the math. Prime at 5 plus 3, it should be 8%. Why was it 40% terms cost? A lot of these lenders, their stated interest rate is not anywhere near as big as what the terms cost is. And you'll see that in just a second. So in, in Pepperdine, when we're surveying all these all-in rates of return, it is all-in rates of return. Not just a which interest rate may be a part of it, obviously. Or not, obviously. If it's, if it's debt, I mean, if it's equity, maybe the interest rate doesn't even come into the conversation. So let's review this more structure. Now, I told you that when you wade into the book and try to look for a subject matter, in this case it would be mezzanine, I organize the book in a way that you can immediately get your mind around what mezzanine is. In the capital side, it's called capital coordinates. So this is exactly, I just copy pasted out of, out of PCM Studio, this chart. Um, so you don't know anything about mezzanine. Somebody says mezzanine, and you go back to the index or cut mezzanine, go right to the capital coordinates chart, this will tell you a snapshot of what mezzanine is. So this is how you educate yourself on a sort of a one-off five minutes or less uh, basis. So I'm not going to go over this now, other than to say it gives you all the key things. Notice how it, it links to tra or value worlds and transfer methods. Walk the walk, talk the talk, walk the walk. Because it does, all of this does fit together. Tells you when to use, key points to consider. Then it's another 20 pages after this with all the details. So if you get into a mezzanine deal, then it educates you on all the details. This just gets your mind around what is mezzanine as opposed to what is angel, as opposed to what is private equity, as opposed to what is, what is, what is, what is. And so, as you can see, um, here's a credit box. Once again, a copy-paste. Senior lenders have mathematical credit boxes, meaning ratios and other things like that. A lot of math. More math than words. All the way up the capital market line, the equity guys are more words than numbers. Do we have a an experienced management team? Do we have a... Uh, have they done hyper growth before, managed hyper growth? Do we have a compelling value proposition, a place in the market? See, that's all sort of narrative. Mezzanine stands between debt and equity. So we have half words, half numbers. <laughs> so you'll see some words, some numbers. And, and, and so what we're talking about is a high grower, because remember, this is a high cost of capital, usually about 20% or so. So high growth, talking about they know what they're doing. Usually these can be interest only deals for four or five years. Sometimes these are interest only for a year or two and then amortization principle. By the second or third year, you better be showing something on these deals because you've got to somehow refinance this, all this mezzanine out at some point, five or six years. Um, there is some boundary that you, you can't be boundaries up, financial covenants and boundaries, very few, but a couple. Um, they won't be in a worse position than a second lien, then blah, 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 blah. So what we have here is, if you have a client, let's say you own a company, you have a client that fits this, meets all this, you can access mezzanine. Let's say you have a client, now we're in the peacock world, probably cost of equity, or cost of capital model. If you have a client that needs half of these, then we gotta dig into the data. And so when we survey at Pepperdine, we survey, <coughs> excuse me, when we survey here, most of the time I'm not here, let's see. When we survey here, the other thing we survey is how important are each of these variables to the, each of the capital providers. Because then we have to give that guidance to the business appraiser or the user of the Peacock model to say one's more important than the other, consider that when you're trying to determine what the cost of capital will be for your subject or your company. And so we give all that guidance, we survey down two or three levels. Um, so it, it's truly the behavior of the market. We're after the behavior of the capital providers here, of which ultimately gets fed into a model, which ultimately drives a discount rate. Are you with me on that? So that's 
So we're not going to go into this now because we don't have time nor the inclination, but I just want to show you what an example credit box looks like. Then, another copy paste right out of the book, every type of capital I do this for you. Capital coordinates, credit box, sample terms. Am I saying that every single mezzanine deal in the world looks like this? No. But I'm saying, here's an example, and this would be real life, by the way, an example of a $7 million mezzanine deal. Here's the interest rate, payment in kind interest pick, which is just a, a way to enhance the, uh, the interest rate in the deal for the, uh, for the lender. What's the term look like? Detachable warrants is an equity sweetener. That's a new term, warrants. Um, commitment fee, closing fee. This would be typical. Does every deal have all this? No. Some deals more expensive, some less. <coughs> but this is a typical deal. You're just trying to get your mind around the terms. In the chapter, it goes through all of this ad nauseum. So you can see what each of these terms means. What if, I even show you at the end of each chapter how to negotiate each of these terms. So, you know. Hey, I'm telling you, I'm, just, I'm quite a guy, right? You know, doing all this for you. All this for you. All right, then I take those sample terms and I create a non-compounded, I hear you, a non-compounded expected return. And I take each term and show you on a non-compounded, why am I making a big deal out of this? Because if I show each one of them on a compound basis, we got to get our 12, HP 12 seeds out, or we got to get our spreadsheets out, and nobody knows how to do that in the private capital markets, at least very few people. So I showed that a non-compounded return because we're not that sensitive to a point or two yet on expected returns. I give some examples in the book. If we were to show it on a compounded and a non-compounded, is there a difference? Of course. Is it so much of a difference that it destroys our understanding of this? No. And so what I want is that if you're a business owner and you've somehow gotten a hold of PCMs too, you could go out with a pencil in the book and take your deal through the math. So what? You're off a, a point or two. I don't even care. We're not that sensitive. And so, but I, you know, I am sensitive to the point where I want you to know that's going to be around a 20% return. Because that's monstrous. The minute you take, ever, 20% money, you put your, your business in play. Because from that point forward, from the minute you take that money, you have to generate returns greater than that by using that money. And most of the time, you're not, well, you can see from the returns to the mezzi, most of the time it's not happening, right? And so we have to do something different. From that minute, you take expensive money, whether it's a senior loan or a junior or this, um, you better be doing something with that money because you just put your business in place. Um, and so I dollarize all that. That's how you, now in the survey, we actually survey based on size of mezzanine loan, what the all-in expected return, what the credit box is. So you, you, we're giving you all kinds of flavor. In the survey. Here, in the book, I'm just showing, okay, here's what it, here's what it looks like from a sample term sheet to expect a return. I know I'm fire hosing you. I'm sorry, but this is the way I teach. And so, all right, we're back to investment bank, banker man. My client intends to use its intellectual capital, meaning know-how, as collateral for the loan. A leading cause of serious root injuries. Now, th this is obviously hilarious, but it's also a serious issue because we have senior lenders, including asset-based lenders, do they care about intellectual capital? No. They're just mathematical against tangible. Has the world, especially the US and Europe, <coughs> where are we? This being tangible capital, this being intangible capital. Where are we on the spectrum? We're all moving towards intangible capital. We, we've already moved our balance sheets. So it's know-how that drives value. You know, not, oh, I got to go build another factory with humping, humping machines. Hey, hey, we're beyond that. There's none of that here. And so, so the senior lenders, including the banks and ABLs, have not figured out yet how to live in an intangible capital world. And they better, they better hurry up. Because, see, that's the lowest cost of capital. You get into this mezzanine and above cost of capital, I got to tell you, there's a reason why the realized returns are so low. It's very, very difficult. Even if you're a great value engineer or value architect, it's very difficult to create returns on investment year in and year out more than 30% on that investment. It's very difficult. Can it be done? Sure. We see examples of it. But more often than not, it won't be done. And so we've got to figure out, especially in Europe and, and uh, this country, how to get the senior lenders to reconceptualize their business to deal with the real world, which is an intangible uh, capital world. Aha. So you've been threatened with the Pepperdine private capital market line for a couple hours. There are different lines based on size of investment. This is the line based on the 5 to $10 million um, investment. So if a bank, you know, five to ten million asset-based lender, ABL, 
Uh, mezzanine private equity venture and factory. And factory, and there's a story on that, we'll get to it. Um, here, remember I showed you the large company, middle market, small, and I said the middle market looks like, doesn't this look like that hockey stick line? Yeah, because I did both graphs. Um, what we have here are median pre-tax returns. I'll say that a hundred more times, even if it takes the now and the Median pre-tax expected returns to the investor. So am I saying that every time you go get a bank loan, it's going to be an all-in 5% one? No. In the survey for a five to $10 million loan, the median pre-tax expected return to the banks is going to be 5%. Now, in all the survey stuff, we show first and third quartile around that based on how the market breaks. So we bracket the return. Now, I'm not doing that here because there's a lot of lines all of a sudden. It, it gets impure almost. But for all the sur each of the surveys, every six months, we create, we recreate this. We show first and third quartiles. It, it will be somewhat dramatic for some of the capital types, not that dramatic for some of the others in terms of the whole market view of it. Um, I like staying at this clean line because this tells us some stuff. Um, it tells us banks are the cheapest form of capital. They always have been. It tells us the ABLs are a premium of 3 to 4% because they're regulated differently and they're organized differently. Okay, that tells us something. It tells us that mezzanine, all of a sudden we have a big jump up in the market to 20-some percent. That's big. That's huge. That tells us we're no longer in the public capital market world, which we step our way up by 50 basis points. Now we're taking gigantic leaps. <laughs> gigantic leaps. And so, okay, private equity for this size, 30%. Monstrous. They structure the deal based on a 30% return expectation. That's what we need to know. They don't receive that. They don't realize that. They structure it, or they try to. Um, venture, same factor. Sell or receivable for cash is factoring. What in the world is going on there? When I wrote, uh, I mean, how can you even have a return? You're selling an asset for cash. Well, do they give you 100%? When you sell a, a million dollar receivable, what do they give you? Uh, 80% or something. You know, it's, it's a little different for you. Well, then they have all kinds of fees, and then they have withholding, and then they do this. They take your firstborn somewhere along the line, and you know, all this, it becomes biblical at some point. And uh, when you end it all up, when I did PCMs 1, nobody had ever, had ever studied all in returns for factors. Well, I write this chapter on factor, not knowing anything about factor, but I had studied 10 or 12 of these contracts. What I, what I discovered was on uh, the factor contract, 10 pages on the average. First page, it says in like 48 font, you are borrowing at prime plus three. Well, none of the business owners are savvy enough to get beyond that. So they go, hey, that's not so bad. That's even better with the bank. Well, the bank won't give me any money anyways. Well, then you read the next nine pages, which is like four font. I had to get out the magnifying glass. And then it's all the terms cost. I said, my God. So I wrote, the, I wrote the chapter, and I sent it to a half dozen of my factory buddies. Didn't hear anything, so finally I started calling them. And, and I got the same response from me. You're not going to publish this, are you? <laughs> well, yes. Well, I haven't talked to them since. Well, we then confirmed all this with the, the surveys, because we survey the factors every six months. Sure enough, it's more expensive than VC. Does that seem right to you? Well, this is why would anybody pay 42%? Why would they do that? Hey, in the jungle, what's the number one rule of the jungle? You do what you got to do. You do what you got to do. What are the two industries that I'm from Charlotte that I saw in the last 20 years go out of business because of factory? Clothing. Furniture and clothing. Textile. Because I used to go to Hickory, North Carolina. And if you, don't go if you haven't been. And it would be like 10,000 little sock mills, little furniture mills. What did they all have in common? Nobody in that building knew anything about finance or anything else. They stopped at the U are borrowing the prime plus three. So what happened is their cost of capital over time, their equity and their business got transferred to the factors. Well, they, there wasn't any trumpet blare. It just happened over time. So all their financial vitality got transferred. So when it came time to modernize the mills and that, they were out of vitality, they were done. So what happened in furniture and textile, and I've seen it for 25 years, it's only the ones that were big enough to be borrowing down below at the bank, somehow they got big enough to do it. Oh, I, I, I know, I'm your virgin ears. In the South, it's all about, back then it was all about paying off people and all that, and having the bankers on your board. So the, the textile and furniture people were smart enough to have arranged that game, had lower costs of capital, and were able to modernize and, and survive. The, the smaller ones, they, they couldn't play that game. They're done. You drive around, unfortunately, I had to go up to Hickory a couple weeks ago. 
It's like an hour outside. It's, um, well, it's Detroit times two, and that ought to tell you everything. There's thousands of buildings that are empty that are never going to be full again, ever, ever. And so there, there's the South in a nutshell. And uh, there's a dissertation waiting to be written on this in terms of does cost of capital matter? It matters because if you're above that return, if your cost of capital is above that return on investment, you're done. It's just a matter of when. You know, it's a matter of how long. It's like that slow but certain ride to nowhere is built is what's going to happen. And so I, I saw it. That's why I, I, I thought factory must be high, but I just, uh, until we did all this work, we didn't know. So, huh, okay. Any, any questions on that? I'm going to take a deep breath. Yes? Just can you, um, so I'm still a little confused about the expected returns versus actually, is this? These are all expected. So when okay, the bank so puts out a deal, median pre-tax, they expect 5% as an industry for this size deal. When the ABL is eight percent, the realized returns are in our unique yeah. to each company. Okay. Yeah. They're a lot lower. Over high. Well, I mean, it, it just depends. I mean, what we I showed you some examples where expected returns of a couple capital types, pegs, mezzanine, are this, but the realized returns where were they? We're down here. It just depends. Uh, do I think the banks have are expecting five and getting one? Well, maybe they are. You know, now that I think about it, maybe they are. Um, it just depends on the capital type. Most of them right now, the realized returns are less than the expected return, which is explains our lack of vitality right now. So this this explains why. Let's let's say that the banks right now are realizing return less than five percent on these type of deals. Let's just say that. Well, if you're a bank, and where are you going to be real aggressive and going out after the next deal? I mean, how aggressive are you going to be? I mean, you're not. I mean, it becomes a capital issue for you as opposed to a capital issue for the borrower. The borrower is going to be able to access. Now, okay, explain to me, using PCM language, what the bank does to restrict the flow of their capital. What do they do? Raise their interest rates. Well, well explain, explain it using PCM's language. So I'm giving you the language now of the market. They restrict their credit box. What we saw when we started surveying all this three and a half years ago is we started seeing an ever-increasing restriction on credit box. Think about it as a spigot, the, uh, the faucet. The, all the capital providers can turn that faucet off by uh, restricting their credit box, the terms of their credit box. We saw the banks restricting three years ago, and it's still restricted. So here's the deal. The companies with over $10 million, this is the survey showed this clearly. The companies with over $10 million EBITDA have unrestricted access to bank capital. Like my New Jersey client, unrestricted, at an extremely low cost of capital. Everybody else has no access to capital. So if you're five to ten million you need to die, you have a little bit. If you're under five million dollar, you go up the line. What do you do as a borrower? You keep going up the line until you attract capital. Well, how much fun is that? I mean once you once you get past this, how much fun is it? Now you see what's going on. What what's happened is the capital markets have restricted their credit box to the point where only the pristine borrowers can access it. That's how restricted it is. Cost of capital, you know, see this is what's so, what's so paradoxical about this. Are we not in a period of historic low interest rates, yeah. but a period of historic high cost of capital? It's paradoxical that is. If you're into paradoxes like I am, it's, it's actually fairly fascinating. And the reason is, is because the credit boxes have been restricted to the point where only a, a, the top 3% can access that low cost of capital. So there it is, yes. From my experience in the last six months or so, ABL, let's say in the New York market, eight is very good to uh, yes. the borrower. Uh, a lot of them are asking for the low teens. Yeah, and here's how I explain that. It, it, it Plus fees. For the, yeah, for the benefit of the camera, the issue is around ABL. Eight sounds pretty good in some areas. There's three tiers of ABL, the book explains this. Tier one, which would be the big borrowers, the $10 million EBITDA, they're, they're below eight. eight. So that deal I put out at L2, that's an ABL deal, believe it or not. L2, ABL. Now, the tier two are the borrowing, so those are fundings over 10 million, the fundings. The two to 10 million fundings, which we call tier two ABL, tend to be around eight, 10. The tier three are the loan sharks. They're the ones that under $2 million in ABL, they're gonna be at 15 to 20. So um, I had to break ABL up into tier one, two, and so we survey by tier as well, because you can't just talk about ABL as a monolithic, because it isn't. Same with factory. 
I, 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 I wrote the book and survey around low, medium, and high volume factoring because the expected return is so different based on volume. And so there is, there is a story within the story here. Peg's the same way. Peg's the over $10 million um, EBITDA deal isn't going to be at 30. It's going to be closer to 20. Whereas, you know, it's, it, it all, that's why first to third quartile does matter here because if the, I'm showing the market in simplest form because this is your first time to see the market. If we were talking about this the fourth time, it would be a far more discreet conversation. We drill down. But you're not ready for that. Read the book, then we'll be ready for that. So, all right. Business transfer. So we're in the third leg of the triangle, and motives still matter. So motive selected value world, motive selects capital type and your capital structure, motive selects transfer channel. So what we're talking about here is all possible ways to transfer part or all of your business. Selling the business is one of hundreds, one of hundreds. So we've got to get that clear. I know that's a, that's a new world view, but that's the way it is. So an owner's motive selects the channel. Now I'm showing seven channels, and this is what created exit planning, the chart on the next slide. It shows the seven channels. Employee, if you want to transfer part or all of your business to your employees, that's one of the channels, the employee channel. Now, and you'll see the next, I'm not going to go over the next six. Yeah. Each channel contains numerous, in some cases hundreds, of transfer methods. These are the actual method, the legalistic mechanism that you do to transfer. Like under employee channel, we have an ESOP, employee stock ownership plan, or management buyout, MBO. And so that would be the mechanism by which you would transfer within the employee channel. So this is the, this is the taxonomy of the market, basically, of how I organized that I just stared at a wall for, I think, three months to come up with all this because it wasn't so obvious. Now, your aha moment of this year will be the transfer method select value worlds. So I've, I've been promising all day that we have this sort of interreliant, interdependent, unified theory, and here's one example of it. So each of the transfer methods selects a value world. <laughs> We're going to go over this because this is, this is important. So here's what the transfer spectrum looks like. It starts like valuation and capital with the motive. It gets channeled, that motive gets channeled to employees, charitable trust, what's that doing there? Family transfers, co-owners, outside retire, which is truly the dream where you, they come in the front door with that wheelbarrow full of money and you just wheel it right out the back door. Uh, outside to continue, which is more likely the reality of the marketplace if you continue to run the business. Um, and then the public. Transfer. So those seven transfer channels, I'm going to say all transfers happen. All transfers of positively valued companies happen there. You could, you could make a case of there would be a bankrupt channel too. Um, under each of these channels, we have a number of transfer methods. Uh, I'm not showing all of them because they go down to bedrock. Because some of the transfer channels have a couple hundred. Like the family business, those are the estate planners. They have nothing better to do than dream up all kinds of acronyms that none of us understand. Grits, grats, grats, I, 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 I get glassy eyed. You ever talk to one of these people? And so, but here's how it works. Employee channel, you know, some of the obvious things, ESOPs, management buyouts, various other things. Charitable trust, that's fairly finite, you know, just two different types of charitable trust. Family is where there's a zillion of these, gifting, skins, grats, flips. IDGTs. And then we have co owners. These are the buy sell agreement types. Um, and it, this is all in the book, by the way, so I'm not saying anything here. It doesn't come. Um, outside, we're, we're talking about the auctions here with the outside retired. Uh, outside continue, this is what the pegs do. The pegs buy 100% of the business typically? No. They do recapitalization. So they buy some part of the business. Um, the owner keeps running the business, still owning some part of the business, and then they go hand in hand and nowhere's no. And so that's what that is. And then the public, which is the IPOs, the DPOs, and all that. So all of the positive light side action is happening somewhere in here. Now, as an exit planner, you don't have to choose just one of these channels. You can be a member of Sheptel, a little bitty this, a little bitty that. Does anybody remember him? Whatever happened to Sheptel? Well, anyway, then, you can do a little bitty this and a little bitty that. You can hit conceivably all of the transfer channels and time phase it over 10 years if you want. I mean, I've seen exit plans now that do have 10-year exits. So you just do this this year, this two years now, and like maybe you get stock this year, and you set up trust next year, and you do this, and then you sell 20% of the stock. I mean, just keep going. I mean, it can be as complicated or as easy as you want it. 
Um, the key is, is whose motive should the exit plan meet? It's got to be the owner, right? I mean, my motive is to do nothing to make $5 million a deal as an intermediary. Well, that can't drive the bus. And so what you got to do is figure out, now, do these owners have clarified motives? Do they know what they're all about? They get up at 8, 8 a.m. and they know, oh, my God, I'm going to set up a family limited partnership today, and that will touch the world of a fair market value, so I'll have to hire a appraiser for that world. Or do they have no idea? they got their head down calling somebody to pay a bill. You know, I mean, where, where are we here? And so, now, I told you that the, these transfer methods select value worlds. ESOP select what value world? Reason. Yeah, but well, that's the authority for what value world? Fair market value. Management buyout select what value world? The investor, or the managers or investors, there's a big hint. The investment value world. Charitable trusts are set up by the U.S. government to subsidize charitable giving. U.S. government being the authority here, what value world? Fair market value. Most of these are set up by the government to, for some purpose. So most of these are fair market value. When we go to the right here, we start getting into market value. So you start talking about auctions and recaps and that. Now, we may not always be in financial market value. Some of these, you know, like a two-step auction, may lead to synergy market value. You know, you see we have a little bit of play here. But, okay, here's a trick question. When we have buy-sell agreements, like a Dutch auction or any of these buy-sell agreements, Who's the authority in a buy-sell agreement? It's Dutch auction, the parties themselves. Oh, yeah, that's a book answer. That is a book answer. We have a book giveaway. <laughs> it can be, yeah, the parties themselves in the buy, most buy-sell agreements decide. Now, they, they decide for whatever their goals are. And so if you have business interruption as the, the, the thing that's going on in the insurable value world, the insurance company says, okay, how, how things are going to be. The insurance company is the authority in insurable value. The parties are can be the authority in a buy-sell agreement. So I, did, I hadn't mentioned that before, so I want to bring it up now. So when we get into this sort of stuff, we're in market value, public value. You see, so each of the transfer methods selects a value world. Therefore, business owners choose a transfer value. You see? So when you set up an exit plan that fits five different transfer methods, that could be five different transfer values because each of those methods may select a different value world. Think about that as an aha moment. I was driving down the road one day when that hit me about knocked me over because I mean I hadn't I hadn't linked all that together yet. Now the we have internal transfers. All this stuff happens within the, the company itself. External transfers. We have a third party coming in. Uh, here we it's sort of a hybrid. We have, we may have a third party. We may not with these buy sells. So it, that's just a nomenclature issue. You don't want to make a big deal out of it. Most of the transfer advisors choose one end of the, the graph or the other. They are either really good at internal transfers or really good at making external transfers. Very few people provide the whole spectrum. Very few in the, in the market today. So, so this is the chart that launched exit planning. So all the exit planning, of which there are three or four or 400, I don't know, uh, exit planning institutes use this chart to describe your exit options, basically. So, all right, so since motives are so important, we're gonna go into some of these transfer motives. Uh, what are the owners, not, I'm not saying these are good or bad. I'm just saying these are motives. Um, create a family legacy, sure, why not? Most of the boomers now are trying to change lifestyle because they're just tired of being hooked to the business. You know, it is like owning a dairy farm, you never get away from it. Um, and so most of the owners, or the baby boomers now, are trying to transfer the majority of the business for a change in lifestyle reason. When I got into this sport of a business, because I don't believe intermediation is a business, it's more of a big game hunting sport. When I got into this 27 years ago, what was the average age of the control transfer owner? Let's round up, 102. Now, just 20 some years later, what's the average age? Well, it's actually 52. So we, we surveyed this, too. it's about 52. So just in one generation. And the, the, the 52 year olds tell us that the main reason they're trying to do a control transfer is to change lifestyle. Um, ESOPs and other things are driven by, you know, my employees got me here, I'd like to make sure that they're taken care of. Hey, if 90% of your wealth is tied up in one illiquid asset, diversify estate, not a bad play, right? Um, give to charity, of course, we have it, and, and then to create liquidity. There's all kinds of transfer uh, motives, and 
it's independent. So uh, the only reason I have this chart is you, if you're in the business, corporate development business, or the intermediation business, you have to understand what's driving the discussion. Because you're going to have to help that owner clarify their motives, because they don't know. Do, do, do any of the owners know the transfer method select value worlds that when they decide which of these are going to do, they just determine their value? Is there one owner in a million that knows that? No. You've got to bring that to the conversation because they don't know. They think their business is worth $10 million regardless of the <coughs> transfer method. See, they never leave owner value rule. <coughs> oh, bless you. They're an owner value. Owner value, they don't care about any of this stuff. Owner value. So you've got to clarify all that. All right. Now, what we're trying to do here from a market value standpoint, if you're trying to help an owner maximize their value, what you need to do is encourage them, as if owning a business isn't a gamble enough, we're trying to encourage them to play the transfer timing slots game. So you need to do, to do that, you need to get three slots aligned at the same time. One is help, get their, help them get their personal sense of transfer straight, especially these control transfers. Where there's a tremendous change in lifestyle. So they don't feel like they're going to the elephant graveyard. So get that slot. Oh, all right, sometimes that can take two or three years, right? I mean, the owner who wakes up Monday morning and says, I gotta get out of this business. See, we got big trouble for maximizing it because we're not gonna have any of the slots alone <coughs> is, is the problem. The second slot you wanna have a line for maximizing transfers is the business. Always have the business maximized. If you ask 100 owners when they plan on transferring, majority control their business, what's the uniform answer? How many years? It's always the same. Five. Now, I've been in this, this sport of a business long enough to know, I go back in four and a half years and ask those same group of owners, when do you plan on transferring this business? What's the uniform answer? Five. We call them the forever five, because they ain't never get now. It's always a five years. It's a big procrastination mortality issue with these people. So along the way, do they plan on maximizing the business performance? Or do they wait till the very day they want to get out like an owl? So you, to maximize the transfer, get their personal sense of transfer ready, so they're personally ready, always have the business ready to transfer. And the third, and by far the most important, is make sure that the market's ready for the transfer. Because the market is the one actually writing a check, you know. All this other stuff's internal, business and, and, uh, and personal is internal. The market. Now, I discovered something 20 years ago that has, has defined, and I mean defined, my life as an investor. And I'm going to let you in on it. This is how I run my life. And I'm going to invite you all into a little game here. So this is actually important. Timing is the most important of the three. The U.S., now this is just the U.S. Main Street markets, middle market. I'm not talking about Wall Street, I'm not talking about Brazil or Europe, I'm talking about the U.S. I haven't studied these other countries. Uh, but the U.S. middle market runs in a consistent fashion a 10-year transfer cycle. Now let's study this. The first three years out of every 10, we're in a recession. Usually a macroeconomic recession, but certainly a deal recession. Meaning the banks are sitting it out, banks are sitting it out, and nothing much is happening unless you're in a top two or three percent company. If you're in a top two or three percent company, just forget about this chart, because you can maximize your exit in time. By definition, there's very few companies that are in the top two or three percent. Most of us are caught on this chart, right? And so the fourth year out of every 10, even though it doesn't show, 1984, 94, 2004, 2014, is a year to, uh, a transition year to profitability. Profits start building the system, there's ever more hope. We come out of our foxholes and don't get our heads immediately blown off. And so what do we do from years five into years eight? Overdue. Remember, we're optimistic animals. We're, we're fearful, greedy animals at the same time. So in years five to eight, the greed shows up. The fear has been dominating prior to that. And so now the greed shows up. And so we come out over viral, over leverage, over build, over because it ain't never going to end, right? And so something happens around the... Forgive me for this, sometimes it's the seventh year. I've shown it all happened in the eighth because the slide, this slide looks better. Looks more aligned, right? Sometimes it happens in the seventh year. In the eighth year, he says, an asset class blows up. Now, it could have been savings and loan, could have been technology. This last round, 2007, what was it? Well, mortgages. And in, in this case, just residential mortgages. What happens when an asset class blows up is risk and return get confused <laughs> in, a, in an asset group. I'm not saying 100% of the asset group is corrupt. What I'm saying is enough of the asset group is corrupt that we can't see through it anymore. We don't know. I mean, what percent 
what was it, five percent of the residential mortgages were really screwed and, and created a corruptness in that whole asset class, right? And then, and then what happens is the investors look around, and we being investors, we want to know what other asset classes are corrupt. Well, I wrote a, what now is somewhat of a famous uh, article in, in October of 07, telling everybody to get out of the water by June of 08. And I stood here in this, in this class and said, everybody out of the water by June of 08. I said, here because for the first time in human history, one economy has six different corrupted asset classes, each of which are over a trillion dollars. And it was the U.S. Now, I'll tell you that. I'll just I'll tell you. What, what were the six? You tell me if they're balanced. Balance meaning little Timmy didn't get a trophy for showing up anymore. So somebody got whacked. Here's the six that I, I named in the article and I was talking about here. I'm showing the same exact chart back in 07. Uh, mortgages, over a trillion dollars, both residential and uh, we'll get to the end, which of these are balanced. Residential and commercial. Credit cards, over a trillion dollars. And so just in the U.S., just talking about the U.S., I had to add commercial and personal borrowing to get to over a trillion. A trillion used to be a lot of money. Now we just uh, throw it out the door and everything. But a, a trillion in current consumer commercial borrowing, private equity, leveraged hedge funds, and credit default swaps because of the counterparty risk. It's scary. Credit default swaps are scary. Fifty trillion dollar opaque market. Who knows what's going on with counterparty risk? Who knows? And so I saw all those. And I said, here's what's going to happen. That by June of 08, this was October of 07 when I wrote it and started speaking. When I said start speaking, I did over 100 radio interviews, wrote a 15, 20 articles, did all kinds of webinars, spoke over 100 times on this exact topic. Said everybody out by June of 08, sell your businesses, sell your stocks, sell your McMansions. I did all, all of those by June of 08. Uh, because these six asset classes have got to reset. It's got to. There's got to be a just come up with when you have that much of your total economy, that's half the U.S. economy measured by trillions, um, that's corrupt, that we can't see through. Of course, I missed it by a few months. It wasn't until September. It's better to be early in these calls than late. <laughs> and so I sold all my business. I sold McMansion, sold all my stocks. I was out. I was out. And so I didn't care. And uh, to some degree, so no. Um, but in any event, so what of those six, which had been reset? So who got whacked in those six? Have, have, which of them have been reset in the last four years? Well, leverage, uh, leverage hedge funds got whacked, right? They didn't have a good enough lobbyists. Oh. See, this all comes down to <coughs> lobbying. And they, so they got whacked. Um, mortgages? Well, we're still resetting those. We haven't really taken a commercial hit. They delayed. We're real good at delaying, denying, you know, denying, delay. And so that's still happening. Credit cards, still resetting, but to some degree they reset. Private equity, have they done mass dumping yet? No. They're still sort of delaying their charter. Uh, credit defaults? <laughs> We had to save AIG, right? Because we didn't know what the counterparty risk really was. And so we still have that out there. Um, so I don't know. You know, it seems to me like what we've done the last three or four years is delay the problem, not reset the problem, because in our political system, we can't face up to anything anymore. She can't get reelected by speaking the truth. I'm not running for anything, so I can talk about this. Um, and so what, what's happened here is this, this, this cycle is playing out again. I had one of my professors, a guy by the name of Bob Lucas, who's a mill mill owner in Chicago, and he famously wrote an article in 07 saying that economic cycles are dead. We're beyond all that now. This is 07. We're beyond all that. And I wrote Bob a letter. I said, Bob, if you're going to keep writing such stupid stuff, they're going to come take the Nobel back. Because the commonality in all these years is us. We're fearful, greedy animals. And the reason this keeps playing over again is we're fearful, greedy animals. And so, and we have, for some reason, we have economic amnesia. We can't seem to remember the prior decade. Why is that? I can't, I, anyways. And so, so when do I buy businesses? What two years? There's only two years I buy businesses. When are they? Recession. Which two years, though? Second and third. Second and third, I'm a bar. So as soon as the crash happens, <laughs> crash being the keyword here, um, I'm out there buying like there's no tomorrow. Remember, I don't buy from individual owners because they want money. And so they, you can't get them on other world loan value for the most part. So who dumps stuff in, after a crash? Well, big corporations, because they, they bought all these sort of non-core little, what they consider little divisions, what we would consider big, 30, 40, 50 million in sales. They dump it for book value. Who's going to dump starting next year and into, into 014? Who owns 35,000 middle market companies 
who is underwater with most of their portfolios and now is, is blown through their charter life and their limit is going to have to have the money back? Oh, okay. <laughs> the pegs are going to wholesale dump. Well, what happened is not all of them. The weak pegs, which is always the bottom half, will start dumping whole portfolios. Who is going to be in line to just buy them all? Well, buy them all. And I'm inviting you all into the game. You don't need any money. I got the money. What I need is mines. I need horsepower. So I created this My Destination thing three or four years ago just to get ready. To have a scalable extreme, we're extreme value creators, not the same for metal stuff. We're, you know, thousand percent people. So if you buy low and sell high, think about what the peg model is built on. Buy high, sell high. Who thought that model up? <laughs> hey, is that what we're teaching in MBA school now? Buy high, sell higher. Does that ever work? And so buy low, sell high. I'll buy a book and everybody wants to dump. I don't care what company. As long as leverage and know-how is the value driver. That's the only thing I care about. And, uh, and so some things aren't. Like brick and mortar, I don't buy. But if it's service business, most distribution, almost all manufacturing, or leverage and know-how is what drives value I'm in. And so, so I've created this, the, the world's largest scalable extreme value creation machine. So we can, we can deal with hundreds of activities. There's a reason, there's a number of reasons why nobody's ever bought hundreds of companies. Because you can't deal with it. I mean, it's almost impossible. I mean, it may kill us, too. I don't know. And so, but I got to try it because it's just something I got to do. I like to stand up the stream on this one. I got to do it. And so, start next year, he says, this time, it's not June of 08. I'm saying economic Armageddon Day is August of 12. And so, we blow. And so, what I'm doing is getting ready for this period to start uh, buying wholesale portfolios. I'll just buy whole portfolios. Don't care. You owe 10 peg, buy them all. Don't care. So, what, what will the pegs do? Here's the behavior of the market. They'll sell the one or two above water companies out of that portfolio and dump the rest. So they'll do. Sell the good ones. I don't want the good ones. I'm going to buy the book. I can't buy the good ones at book. So go sell the two that are going to be about the math. Two out of ten will be okay. Sell those. Don't want them. I want the other eight or whatever it is. And so then we'll, we'll go about our merry way of trying to build value. When do, what's the only year I sell? When do I sell everything? The seventh year. So you pay off all of that. Don't take, I don't take any money out of these business. Pay off all of that. <coughs> go to sell them like crazy and hope I can get out by then. So I have to backward schedule. So we start selling these darn things in six to be out by seven and hopefully early eight. Because this is this will repeat itself because we're fearful greedy animals. Um, so there it is. Now there, there's there's a big, big issue here that's gotten my full attention, but I don't it won't stop me, but in some ways I wish it would. Every 40 years in the U.S., the whole system resets itself because we haven't taken enough pain in these intervening years. Well, let's let's walk through time: 1890, <coughs> 1930s, 1970s. <laughs> We're in it. We're in that period where we have a lost decade or most of it because the whole system—it's like a boiler. It's been building up. We haven't released it out because little Timmy's got to get his trophy for showing up, and nobody can get hurt. You know, we have government now has to save everybody. And so what happens is the system blows. Now, that's going to happen this decade. Now, should that alone stop me? Well, yeah, but it won't. And so because of what we, we think we've built. And so but I'm going into it with open eyes, knowing that this could be, this could be trouble here for, for this decade. And I suspect it will be. Um, and Europe's just the vanguard movement of this. Europe's the vanguard we're next. And it's going to be. Um, but anyway, so that, there's the game. There's the transfer cycle game. Any, any questions on this? No, no, file up in here. All right. So, owner motives. Mike Nall and I always say owner motives matter most. And it's, first of all, it's kind of a pretty thing to say, but it's, it's really true. So we take private code for each of the value worlds in the book, because all these, these valuation numbers come straight out of books, so don't ask me. And then we link transfer method to which value world does it select, what is the value in that value world? So here's the proof in the pudding. If there's a buy-sell agreement and the parties are the authorities and they say that that's going to select asset market value, so for some reason a lot of parties select book value. I never, I never quite get that, but they do. Uh, let's say in this case they do that. Private code's work, and these are 100% values, equity values. I had to have apples, 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 apples. So it's private code's worth 2.4 million. Let's say in another case, the transfer method is management buyout. The managers and the investors, they can only raise so much money, only have so much money. 
and that that's why this is seven and a half million and not a bigger number. Um, that selects investment value. There we are. Look at this. We just three x the difference just from one value world to the next. Let's say that we're looking at ESOPs. That selects fair market value. Why? Because the ERISA laws say it does. We're up to nine point two million. Equity recapitalization. Uh, the main peg tool selects financial market value. Why? Because the pegs won't share synergies. Um, now we're at 12 million. Let's say that Joe Main Street gets his number. He says that I won't sell for less than 15.8 million, and the one time in 100, it happens. So now, because that's a negotiated thing, it's not so much negotiation, right? Joe just says I need 58. They pay it. Well, that, that negotiated selects owner value. We're at 15. Hey, look at this. Look at this constellation of values. Now we're into the auction world. Let's say the private could have sold through a synergy market value, value world. We're at 16.6, public, 18.2, same business, same time, a proliferation of correct values. And I'm telling you that there's 30 of these. I'm just showing, well, six or seven. There's 30 of them. Now, how far are we away from one true value? So don't get caught up in this whole thing of there's a value for a business. So when anyone says, owner or otherwise, say, that business is worth, the first question is, you should ask, well, what value world are you talking about? Because it could be a tremendous difference in values. And so this is why I wrote a somewhat famous article back in 04 called Business Owners Choose to Transfer Value. Uh, that, like anything, anything else I've said today, is available for free on MyDestination.com. So just go out there and uh, you can download it. Seven pages that shows all this linkage in one place. Because you don't want to read a 700 page book to get all this linkage. In seven pages, I break it all down. So you can see how all this constellation of value works. Uh, this is a level of complexity that 20 years ago did not exist in the private capital markets. Why? Because we didn't have the proliferation of capital providers who were segmented 20 years ago. So this whole thing is relatively new. That's why no one could have written private capital markets uh, until I did, basically, because it wasn't until that point that we institutionalized all the capital providers, just the last 10 or 12, 15 years. And so this, that's why this is all new. It isn't that, it isn't like this should have been discovered 50 years ago. No, I mean, the middle market 50 years ago was like the family farm. They, since there weren't capital providers, you really just couldn't get out of it. You almost had to, in most cases, hand it down to the next generation because there was no selling out. Just sort of, sort of like a family farm that way. But now we've got all this, this robust, we have the most robust middle market in the world, by bar none. Um, the, what's missing in it is the value creation aspect. <laughs> we've, we've got all the capital lined up, and now we've got the nomenclature and the taxonomy of how to make decisions. What we don't have is the value creation, which is, uh, which is a shame. All right, so what do we do here? So the question is, if, if I'm even half right, which I am, in terms of what's about to happen and what is happening, you've got to develop your own personal strategy in terms of how do you play it, because we're all caught in this, right? I mean, the one thing that's for sure, I don't care where you are in the world, one way or another, we're all in this, this game together. I mean, that's the nature of globalization. And so we've all got to develop a personal strategy for the next two, three, four, five years. So as we didn't cause, no, nobody in this room caused this problem, even though uh, most people say I did for some reason. We didn't cause this problem, <laughs> but we, we have to figure out how to personally play this game. Um, I mean, from a, from a middle market standpoint, just from an intermediation standpoint, I mean, this is going to be defined by cross-border transactions. This is going to be defined by why aren't you running auctions for capital. I mean, there's all kinds of why aren't you offering two years ahead of the transfer to help create value in that company to be transferred. You see how it changes the whole dynamic? It used to be you'd show up and start, you'd have that business in the market three months from now. Well now, that's such a tough bet because you're probably not gonna meet the owner's goals that way. So everything's backward schedule. If I'm right about the transfer cycle, doesn't this just kill the M&A market the next five years? Except for the two or three percent. The two or three percent, they're, they're good all the time. Well, yeah. That's why out of every decade, four years I'm an agent, intermediary, four or five years I'm a principal, uh, owning, and then one year, which is now, I'm in transition. See, that's the way it is. Now I'm just taking what the defense will give me. I mean, that's, that's what's available. So what most intermediaries do is they starve for the next five years. 
because they don't have a plan B. They don't have a plan B in terms of how to repurpose their skill sets because their skill sets are more aligned to just sell side or just buy side. There, there's a lot of different ways to, to play this uh, game. And what, I, what I'd really like you to do, what I consider success is, I'd like you in the next week, not this week, because you've got your minds are going to be, I'm not the only one who's going to be fire hosing. In the next week, take a quiet moment, sit down, stare at the ceiling, and write down, well, then stop staring at the ceiling, so write down everything you've heard, not just today, this morning, but throughout the week, that can help you develop your personal plan, your personal wealth creation strategies. Write all that down, because there's some magic of going from here down through here onto a piece of paper. Write that down and post it so you see it every day. That's one of the secrets of Midas is all of the stuff that we think the owners should be looking at and considering we have in front of them all the time. Write that down, and if there's a whole lot of things on that piece of paper, I'll consider this a great use of time for all of us. And with that, thank you very much.